continue with our program, we would like to welcome Dr. Roger Nasera, radiologist, stem cell expert. All right, well, there's my book. Uh, it is Cells That Heal Us from Cradle to Grave, a quantum leap in medical science. You know, stem cells is a big deal. It's a, it's a paradigm shift in medicine, and it has not been very well integrated into current uh, medical practice. And that's really uh, what this book is an attempt to do, is to help that along a little bit. So we're going to run through some history. Uh, people feel obliged to know about the history of wars and the history of governments and laws, but Medical history is required at a time like this because this paradigm shift is, is, a, is a step that occurs about once every hundred years. Advances in medicine have saved vastly more lives than have been lost in all the wars in history, Dr. Carl Sagan, and it's definitely true. Medicine evolves through time. Anybody know what's going on here? Uh, it does a little bit, Richard. Anybody know what's going on here? This is what they used to do constantly. Trepanation. These, we see skulls in graves that date back thousands of years with holes in them because this was the treatment to get rid of the evil spirits that are inside the calvarium, I guess. And anyway, this went on uh, for a, a tremendous amount of time. So let's look, at, let's look at the average life expectancy over the last 400 years. That's really all of medical history right there, the last 200 years, really. But let's look at, let's look at 400 years and back in the day when they did trepanation, the average life expectancy, as you can see these, these, uh, these dots, are about 35 to 40, all right? But then something happened here. Anybody know what it is that changed the world of medicine? Huh? What? No. Good try, though. The immune organ system was discovered by Dr. Edward Jenner when he developed his smallpox, uh, cowpox vaccine. And this, this changed the entire uh, uh, human condition and the life expectancy started to go up. Now, it would have leveled off at about there, but something else happened right there. Anybody know what that is? That's antibiotics. That, Basically, uh, the little ring in the middle is a, a fungus that through evolution had figured out how to kill bacteria. And so you see the yellow is the bacteria growing around it, but it won't grow close to that fungus, which is penicillin. Now these two, here's what people don't know. These two events saved exponentially more lives than anything else. They're the only two really important events in medical history in the last 200 years. Now, what was discovered had existed for, for eons, okay? It was discovered. It was not invented. Nobody invented the human immune organ system, and nobody invented penicillin. They discovered it. That's important because basically what you're doing is you're, you're revealing nature. You're revealing the effects of DNA. Now the problem with every hundred years, and, and the reason we need to look at medical history at a time like this, is that people don't remember because a hundred years ago we weren't around. And everybody that was around 100 years ago are gone now. So if we don't read medical history books, we're not going to know this information. But smallpox would wipe out 30 to 40 percent of infected uh, individuals. A, you, there is no smallpox anymore. 
uh, influenza before the uh, vaccines was, would take out half the population. Tetanus was ubiquitous. Uh, whooping cough, uh, hemophilus influenza, congenital rubella with its mental retardation and microcephaly, uh, tuberculosis and other infections, other bacterial infections uh, were rampant. Do you remember polio? You know what these little boxes are? This is before they had positive pressure respiratory devices. So the only way to get someone to breathe that couldn't breathe on their own was to create a vacuum in this thing. Uh, patients with polio lived their entire life. Once they got polio, they put in this box and they stayed there till they died. So if I were going to offer you a treatment for whatever disease you have, and I said, well, look, it's going to be painful and a little bloody. It's a little dangerous, there are, but it's new and it's high technology. And, uh, but you could die if you don't get it. And you could die if you do get it. But we think you'll die less if you do get it. Okay? So here's such a procedure. It's called coronary artery bypass graft. Now, this is impressive. It's expensive. It's high tech. It's got to be effective. Who would do something like this to another human being unless it were really going to help them out? Anybody want to take a stab at what percentage of patients that get this procedure live longer than if they don't? Huh? Really, 30? 30 is awfully low. Wouldn't you think it'd be more like 90? No? All right, well, as Hippocrates uh, said, of several remedies, the physician should choose the least sensational. 11% benefit. 89% don't live one extra day. And some die sooner. It took them decades to figure out uh, when cabbage would be good and when it wouldn't be. And in certain lesions, certain abnormalities, uh, it actually killed patients. So they learned, well, if they have that particular abnormality, don't do the surgery. So how do we judge a, a medical therapy, new or old, and the answer is clearly by the amount of saved human lives and the averted human suffering, not by how fancy and impressive the high technology. That is a dangerous infatuation. Now the Mayo Clinic puts this uh, thing on the internet to explain that carotid endarterectomy may prevent a stroke if you have a severely narrowed carotid artery, and indeed, uh, there's proof of that. Now, this is uh, basically an attempt to take the narrowing part of the artery out so that it can't narrow the artery. They take the plaque out, and indeed, it is impressive, it is expensive, and it's high-tech. It must be very effective. Who would do this to a human being if it wasn't very effective? Anybody want to take a stab? It's the old answer. 11% benefit. And they don't get completely well. They just have fewer strokes. 89% of patients having this thing done don't benefit one iota. And it's a prophylactic procedure, so... So how do we judge a medical therapy, new or old, by the amount of saved human lives and the averted human suffering? Not by how fancy and impressive the high technology. That's a dangerous infatuation. Now, stem cell medicine is important to humanity. It's going to change the world. The question is when, soon or later. Before the baby boomers are dead or not? That's, I think that's the focal question. And it's a public issue, and we're never going to unring that bell. It's a public issue because of the stem cell debate. And it has interfered. The fact that it became a public issue has interfered with the progress of medicine, I believe, 
because it's controversial. And misinformation is everywhere. So public education is our only hope, which is why I'm here and why I wrote this book. Let's take a, 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 a listen to what Dr. Albert Einstein has to say about nature. Look deeply into nature and then you will understand everything. That's an awfully amazing statement. And this guy doesn't make statements without thinking about it first. We only know one one thousandth of one percent of what nature has to teach us. That's the hooker. Hippocrates. Natural forces within us are the true healers of disease. Now this is a white blood cell, that big blob in the middle, and all the other round things are red blood cells. And the little, the little black thing in front sort of, uh, I can't point, but see that little black thing there? Well, that's a bacterium, all right? And basically, the white blood cell is going to chase down the bacterium because it cannot kill it outside of itself because then it would also, if it emitted a poison, it would kill the other cells. So it's got to engulf it and then kill it so that the killing will stay within uh, the cell. Now the key to all this uh, cellular activity is the communication system that it has that we've learned about recently. These little droplets of biochemicals that are emitted by the cells, the cells of these big balls here. Now, the, the, the orange cell may well be telling the purple cell, reproduce, or stop reproducing, or become a different type of cell. This is how they, they talk to each other. This is a little pipette that's putting cytokines in front of these white blood cells that are chasing it. Now, stem, adult stem cells are just like this. They'll follow certain cytokines. And the point is that cells move. Uh, cells move around. All right, so what makes a stem cell a stem cell? It's all about how the cell reproduces. Here's a cell. And it's going to make another cell. And oh, it looks just like the first one. And it's going to do it again. This is linear cell reproduction. We've got a, a square cell there. Anybody, can anybody guess which is the stem cell? One, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. Anybody? How many think it's seven? Yeah. A lot of people fall for that. <laughs> it's this one because the stem cell is going to stem it's going to go in two directions and make a stem it's the, the lineage stems and that's why it's called a stem cell this is the only cell here that's making a cell different from itself. That square cell is what makes the round cell a stem cell because it's different from itself. And this is called pluripotency. So stem cells are cells that make cells different from themselves. There are only two places in nature where cells make cells different from themselves. One is in bone marrow. It's called hematopoiesis. Adult stem cells make blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, red blood cells, etc. A white blood cell is not made by another white blood cell. It's made by a stem cell, which is different from it. Okay? And we've known this forever. I learned it in medical school 30 years ago. The other place we see it is in embryonic uh, development embryonic stem cells and they stem 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 and then the baby's born so everything below that line is the newborn's baby uh, the newborn cells 
okay? Everything above the line is prenatal. Everything below the line is postnatal, which medicine calls adult. So we have this crazy situation where you have babies that have adult stem cells, uh, or adult cells. All babies have, have a, all adult cell, cells, and that can be a little bit confusing. There's trillions of cells, but there's only 220 cell types. Some of them are stem cells. In other words, some of the 220 different cell types in a baby that we cells, the 220 uh, cell types that we have from cradle to grave, some of them actually make other cells, uh, different from themselves, and they're called adult stem cells because they're adults and they're stem cells. And they make blood. And there you have it, one, two. And at the beginning of the 21st century, this is all we knew. We didn't know that adult stem cells healed the body as well. We thought these were the only two functions, to make a baby and to make blood. So there has been a quantum discovery in the last 10 years, and I call it the adult stem cell healing organ system. And basically what happens is this. If the liver is injured, those cells that are injured are going to leak out cytokines, and they're going to go into the blood after they accumulate, and they're going to affect the bone marrow and tell it to make more adult stem cells, which are then going to come back to the liver and heal it. Now, we know a lot about what we do know about stem cells from studying uh, leukemic patients. And basically what happens is we make these kids pretty sick, uh, by radiation and chemotherapy to kill their leukemia, which lives in their bone marrow. So you can't kill some of the cells, you gotta kill them all. So they, they become bone marrow ablated and they'll die rapidly. They have to be rescued by uh, taking someone else's bone marrow and transplanting it and it grows and it replaces the entire bone marrow. We can do this with umbilical cord blood as well now. All right, Astronon's bone marrow. Tried to make this entertaining. All right. Um, so now imagine this, and don't get confused with the X's and the Y's, okay? It's girls and boys. We take two girl mice. They only have XX chromosomes in all their body cells, all right? And we irradiate them until they don't have any bone marrow left. And this guy looks a little worse for the wear. Now we take a fresh mouse, but it's a boy, which means its cells have XY chromosomes. And we take out the bone marrow, and now we have XY bone marrow that we put into this poor mouse to rescue it from, a, from certain death. So that's the situation. We've got a girl body and boy bone marrow, which allows us to trace it. So we take this poor mouse and we're going to stop circulation in a part of its brain by tying off the carotid artery. And give, we're going to give the, uh, the mouse a, an infarct, and there it is. And we let the, we let the uh, mouse recover takes weeks and then we biopsy right there and we find that that infarct is now filled with Y chromosome containing brain cells. We never put brain cells into this mouse that were XY anything. We put XY adult stem cells into this mouse. So what this experiment proves is that the bone marrow must have delivered adult stem cells that went to the infarct and changed into brain cells, okay? The adult stem cell healing organ system. Then they said, well, maybe it just works in the brain. So they said, well, let's, let's torture this poor mouse some more of our different set of mice and let's 
let's do the same thing with the heart and tie off the uh, coronary artery. And we give the, this is a, a cross section of the heart with the infarct is the pale part. And now we have a girl heart because the whole body is, is girl, XX, except the bone marrow. And we biopsy that and we find Y chromosome containing heart cells. We never put Y chromosome containing heart cells into this mouth. The only way it could have happened is if the bone marrow, which is the only place that has XY chromosome, that we put in, we transplanted, must have found their way to the heart where it was infarcted and replaced it. This is the adult stem cell healing organ system. The Mayo Clinic uh, did a study and they showed that if they, instead of mice, if they took real people who were treated for leukemia, who had their bone marrow wiped out, and then they were gender mis mismatched. In other words, we started with a female patient and we put a male bone marrow. We got the same situation set up. Now you can't go tying off carotid arteries, but what you can do is wait for them to die and then do your examination. Well, they found, they found white chromosome cells everywhere, in the heart and uh, in the brain. So let's say someone lives 20 years after their bone transplant. Every time they get up, every time they get a cold, they're gonna, they're gonna replace cells in the nasal passages. Every time they get uh, a, heart a little bit of a heart attack or heart ischemia, they're gonna replace heart cells with new, uh, with new heart cells. This is the adult stem cell healing organ system. Now, the, perhaps the greatest thing that doctors are able to understand when they are exposed to it. The problem is 95% of doctors haven't been exposed to this. But when they're exposed, this is what hooks them, what I'm about to tell you. These are, you see the little red blood discs and then the white blood cells. These are white blood cells. And if you notice on the right, there's more white blood cells. Well, this is a patient that has a high white blood cell count, probably has an infection of some type. The new science is that we now can measure the count of adult stem cells in the blood. CD34, mesenchymal, CD133, whatever. We can differentiate them all and we can do blood counts. Okay? This is just a schematic I'll go through quickly. This is a blood vessel in the center, okay? And then just body cells around it, okay? It's just a schematic. Of course, it's connected, the blood is connected to the bone marrow. There's a communication between the two. If there's injury right up there, what's going to happen is that those injured cells are going to leak out their cytokines. And these little purple dots are the cytokines building up in the tissue. And we can measure that. Now notice, it would be different than if we measured down here, there'd be no cytokines. It's only going to happen, the cytokines are only going to happen where there's the injury. Then, as the injury continues, the cytokines get so numerous that it starts to spill into the blood, and we can measure that. Then, of course, if, if cytokines are in the blood, they're going everywhere, including the bone marrow. And the bone marrow is hormonally stimulated to produce adult stem cells when those cytokines reach it. And we can measure that, of course. And then, of course, they spill back into the blood because the bone marrow is producing them. And the, the stem cells are going to increase in number in the blood, and we can measure that. Okay? Then, we still haven't got the, we got the stem cells in the blood, but we don't have it into the tissues where the injury is. For that, we need our cytokine chemo-attraction, chemotaxis or chemo-attraction trick. And basically, the stem cells then end up concentrated around the cytokine injured cells, the, or the, the cells that are injured that are producing cytokines, and of course we can measure all that. And then the most amazing thing happens. The stem cells start to stem. They transdifferentiate into the cells required to heal the problem and they stem, stem, stem. All right. 
and that's cellular healing, the adult stem cell healing organ system. Once you have that background, now you're going to understand this, this, uh, this research. Uh, if somebody has a stroke, we can measure their CD34 adult stem cell count in their blood. If it doesn't go up to a certain level in one month, they won't get their neurologic deficit back. We can predict this now. If they do go up a certain level, to a certain level, to a certain uh, height, then they will get better. And that's just a, a basically, if you're old, uh, your stem cells are less robust than if they're young. And that's a, that's a big that's a big part of this. And so uh, many of these stroke patients are old and they, their bone marrow is worn down. You know, if we, if, if a doctor thinks a patient has appendicitis or pneumonia, he looks for an elevated white blood cell count. But no doctor would be afraid to diagnose either of those diseases if the patient didn't have an elevated white blood cell count and they were very old. We just know older people can't mount the white blood cell defense. And that's why patients die uh, of pneumonia when they get into their 120s. <laughs> All right. Um, same thing in the heart. If, if, if you, the way your heart gets ill is that the artery speeding would get narrowed with atherosclerosis. And the way that happens is high blood pressure, high cholesterol, whatever toxins, smoke toxins, injure the cells that line the arteries, the endothelial cells. When they get injured, they spill their cytokines, the cytokine uh, amount goes up, the bone marrow sends out EPCs, endothelial precursor, adult stem cells, and that number goes up, and it repairs the damage to the endothelial cells, and this happens Atherosclerosis starts in teenage years, so this is this starts at you know age 13, and it goes on all your life. And you don't get the disease as long as your EPC level, cell level, is high enough. When you have the disease, it's because you wore down the adult stem cell bone marrow. It's worn down, can't produce adequate or enough uh, EPCs, and so the upshot of this is if I take a patient and draw blood, and if the EPC cell number is too low, I can predict when we do a coronary arteriogram, he's going to have narrow. Because before you can get atherosclerosis, your adult stem cell healing organ system has to be beaten down to the point where it can't produce enough EPCs. Maternal microclimerism is uh, an enormous uh, indication of uh, the generic nature of baby adult stem cells. This is why the next first autologous stem cells or cell, uh, cells from fat, or this has to be uh, okayed by the FDA. But then the next step is going to be uh, using baby cells that are left behind in the placenta or the cord blood because they're more robust. They, they reproduce like 40 times faster than a, 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 a 60 year olds. Or, and they, uh, they produce 40 times as much uh, cytokines. So we want to do this, but you'll hear doctors say, wait a minute, you're going to take cells from somebody over here and put them into somebody else? They're going to get rejected. Well, they don't, and the proof that they don't is maternal microchimerism. All, every mother has cells in her brain and heart and liver from every one of her babies. Your mother has your cells living in her bone marrow, in her liver, in her brain, in her heart, etc. Now, those cells of yours that went into your mother are foreign to your mother's blood because half of your genes come from your mother but the other half come from your father those are completely unrelated okay so baby cells have the ability 
to go into a foreign immune circumstance and survive. Now, that happens because of Darwinian evolution. Because there's survival advantage to that. If there weren't, it wouldn't happen because nowhere else in biology do we see this kind of friendliness between an immune system and somebody else's cells. Um, there was a study where up to 14 children, your survival actually, for every three children, you live an extra year if you're a woman, up to 14 children. And, uh, and some believe it's because of this allogeneic or hemiallogeneic uh, uh, transplantation. All right. But I think, without a doubt, the first thing that's going to be okayed by the FDA, which is really going to set this thing off, is going to be the fat derived. Adult stem cells get trapped in fat. Okay, they get trapped. It's like the Roach Hotel. They can get in, but they can't get out. And when they go into fat, because fat is not a metabolically active uh, tissue, they basically hibernate. They go to sleep. So let's say we're five years old and we've got a sore throat and we're staying home from school. Our adult stem cell number is up there to heal the cells that are injured from the sore throat, from the vi viral disease or bacterial disease. And uh, they go to sleep at, five, at, at a robustness of five years old. Then you get another one when you're six. Now you got six-year-old robust cells in your, in your fat sleeping. Now you're 80 years old or you're 50 years old. And you need baby cells. You can get them right from your fat because they've been accumulating there all your life. The FDA says we can't do that. I'm going to take off my jacket if that's okay. Um, the FDA says we can't do that. And yet, and yet, they said it's they say it's okay to take fat from one part of your body and put it into another part of your body, which is uh, uh, an autologous stem cell, or excuse me, an autologous cell transformation or transplantation. They you can do it for aesthetic reasons, but you can't do it to help someone with MS or some other uh, disease. That's the problem right there. That's what's got to change. Prayer is indeed good, but while calling on the gods, a man should himself lend a hand. Hippocrates. Well, uh, my dear friend, Dr. Neil Reardon, went to Central America and started clinics to actually treat people with this amazing new discovery. And uh, we'll go, I know that other speakers are going to go over some of this, uh, but we we treated, among other things, uh, cardiomyopathy and uh, uh, saved lives with it. And a heart transplant is $250,000. And the, this, we have treated patients very successfully and averted a heart transplant with $20,000 worth of stem cell surgery. Autism, cerebral palsy. A lot of these patients are obviously are very neurologically uh, uh, injured, but uh, you can improve their neurologic status maybe by just a little bit, which is enough to make an enormous change in their their life uh, uh, their lifestyle, if you want to call it that, and and that of their uh, caretakers. Rheumatoid arthritis, muscular dystrophy, spinal cord injury, and multiple sclerosis, of course. Stem cell therapeutics is going to improve the human condition no less than vaccines and antibiotics. It is less costly than the status quo by a long shot. It is the solution to the health care cost crisis. It's 18% of our GDP is spent for health care in this country. The next closest country is France at 11%. And then they drop precipitously after that. Uh, it's, you know, when a doctor, when you come to a, to a doctor and you're sick, 
what do they do? They draw blood, right? I mean, they'll chit chat for you, poke you around, but then they're going to draw blood. Why? Because if something is off, it's going to go up. Something's going to go up out of normal range. Well, this number, 18% of GDP for healthcare, is out of range. Now, to add insult to injury, you can't say, as a proud American, well, we pay 18% of GDP, but look at the healthcare we get. It's just the best in the world. No, it's not. The World Health Organization 2000 report put us for probably the premier uh, outcome-based parameter of a healthcare system is how long your folks last and, and how healthy they are. We came in at 72. There are 71 countries whose citizens are healthier than us by epidemiological analysis. If you look at disease-specific uh, benefit, for example, if I know I'm going to have diabetes mellitus, is it better for me to be born in India, England, or the United States? Well, we came in 37 behind 36 other countries who paid vastly less than we do. Something's wrong. And it has nothing to do with how we pay for medicine. We seem to be completely convinced that if we could just pay for medicine the right way, everything would be changed. The U.S. patent system. All right. If we had a, a vitamin C formula that could cure 90% of individuals suffering from a given disease, 90%. And we stack it up in America against an unnatural synthetic drug that only cured 10%. Because it takes hundreds of millions of dollars to do the research to prove efficacy, you have to have a patent on it. If you don't, you're never getting your couple of hundred million dollars back. And everybody knows this. So in our system, the 90% natural cure will never, ever happen. It'll never be for all of us. Oh, you might have a pocket here or there where someone's taken a chance. But remember the way the, remember how medicine works. There's this thing called the standard of care. The only, re the only way a doctor can get sued for malpractice is if it's determined in the court of law that he has not done the usual thing that a reasonably intelligent doctor would do. So if you're doing something different from everybody else, you are a setup for malpractice. And not only that, the standard of care is all that uh, uh, insurances will reimburse for. So we're stuck. This is a stuck situation. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't change. And so the problem that we have is medicine. Our medicine is not that good. That's the problem. We don't research it properly. Life is, a battle is not a battle between good and evil. Rather, it is a battle between truth and lies. Miguel Ruiz. Um, <laughs> a healthcare cost crisis. Patentable means synthetic or unnatural. Natural is unpatentable. Therapeutic effic efficacy is in humanity's best interest, not therapy patentability. Nature will always be most efficacious. Well, embryonic stem cells are easily patentable because if you ever injected them into someone, you'd get a cancer right away. So you certainly have to do biotechnical things to them. And every step of those biotechnical things that you do to embryonic stem cells is another patent. Adult stem cells are very difficult to patent. You can patent them. You can patent anything you want, but proving, you know, if you've got 10, 20, 30 uh, uh, million dollars to defend the patent in uh, patent court, because that's what you're going to need. How, so how could medical scientists and scholars ignore a great medical discovery. 
this guy had the answer in his famous uh, vast military industrial complex speech, uh, which he gave from the White House just as he was exiting. There has been a technological revolution during recent decades. In this revolution, research has become central. It also becomes more formalized, complex, and costly. Today, the solitary inventor tinkering in a shop has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists and laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research. These are his exact words. Partly because of the huge costs involved, a contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. So ba there, there is another line, I don't know where it is, I've got to fix my slide, uh, where he's basically saying that scientists are in grave danger of being dominated by monetary interests. And he worried about that 50 years ago that if research is so expensive and so organized, will it go in the right direction for humanity? It's basically what he's saying. He's saying, well, I can see a situation where it won't. And it certainly hasn't in stem cells. We can treat animals. That slide advanced. <laughs> we can treat animals because we don't have the same interference. And they've done, they've done very, very well with, uh, with animals. Um, every hundred years. So we had 200 years ago vaccines, 100 years ago antibiotics, and now we have the adult stem cell healing organ system. So my foundation in my book basically is trying to say to the FDA, all doctors must be free to use a patient's own healing cells to help them when they get sick. That's my message. And, it's a, and it's, it's a crime that they can't. And uh, remember, the embryonic stem cell folks are going to be successful in producing healing cells, but they will be heavily patented and extremely expensive, and we won't solve our health care cost crisis. Now, why will they be successful? Because embryonic stem cells make adult stem cells. They make all 220 cells types. They can make anything. Now, they can't, they can't do it yet and not still have some totipotent cancer cells in there. And incidentally, we get, I'm on a roll now, incidentally, we get, we get criticized because our cells aren't pluripotent enough. I've never seen a totipotent cell that wasn't cancer. What are they bragging about? You know, Embryonic stem cells are at the top there. They're, they're a whole different world from the cells at the bottom. If they're not in the embryo, under enormous control of the embryonic development process, they go nuts. You can, embryonic stem cells make a seven pound baby in nine months. There's not a single cancer as fast as that grows that can produce a seven pound tumor in nine months. Can't do it, it's too fast, it's fero they're ferocious. They're ferociously malignant when they're outside the embryo. Inside the embryo, they're fine. And nobody really understands uh, why that is so, because we don't understand embryogenesis. All right, I'm, I'm done, that's it. <laughs>